Hello, everyone. My name is Juanita Alvarez. I'm the Americas Regional Head for the World Green Building Council. Thank you so much for joining us in this webinar. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, this is going to be a webinar with our project partner base and with some great keynote speakers that we will be talking about how cooling as a service can accelerate transition to net zero carbon buildings. As you know, the World DBC is a membership organization where we have around 70 green building councils around the, the world. And it, within the Americas, we have a specific project that's called the CDS Climate Action Project, supported by the Building Efficiency Accelerator, where our main interest is to promote energy efficiency and net zero carbon roadmaps for cities and national governments. That is why this webinar is very important for us and uh, the partnership with BASE and Cooling as a Service is, as key, is a key element in the development of our efforts. So thank you so much for joining. And uh, we have different speakers from all across uh, the world that will be talking to this particular topics. They will be presented um, in detail by Carla from BASE. And I just wanted to give you a few general instructions uh, for all of you to know throughout the webinar. So please, if you have any questions, you can use the chat box that you can see on your panel control. And uh, we will review the questions. And at the end of the presentations, we will have some time for Q&A. This webinar will also be recorded and shared with all of the participants that are joining us today. And the slides will be available as well at the end of the webinar. If um, you need further information from the topics that will be presented, we will be sharing uh, a follow-up email with further details and information that we hope you can find very useful. So I want to thank all of our speakers. I want to give a special thank you to our partner, uh, BASE and Cooling as a Service. And thank you everyone for joining us. Now I will give it, um, give the word to Carla. Thank you. Hey, thanks Juanita and thanks to the World Green Building Council. Hey, good morning everyone, I'm Carla, Senior Climate and Environment Finance Specialist at, at BASE. That's the Basel Agency for Sustainable Energy. I've been working for over two decades on sustainable development, focusing on climate change projects, mainly on adaptation and mitigation, but also on climate finance, and with a background in the financial sector. During the last seven years, I've been involved working with BASE, developing innovative business models to scale up the adoption of uh, climate change solutions, specifically energy efficiency and renewable energy. And as part of that effort, we've developed the cooling as a service model. I'll be the moderator of this webinar today. So first thing that I'd like to ask you is to encourage you to send questions via the chat, as Juanita explained. Please indicate to whom you're asking the questions that, that will facilitate the work at the end of the, of, the, of the webinar. All these questions will be answered. If not now live, we will send like questions and answers afterwards in a thank you email, together also with the links to the webinar and also we are gonna send you a link with the registration for our newsletter in case you wanna keep informed of all the progress that we're doing with cooling as a service all over the world, and also be updated of all the events we are launching, including even an e-summit. So let's start. I'm very pleased in this case to introduce the four speakers that we have today. In first place, we will have Thomas Modmans. Thomas, who is my colleague in BASE, leads the CAS initiative. He will present the Cooling as a Service model and the Cooling as a Service initiative and its progress. Thomas will be followed by Chris Elizondo and Martin Mendez. Chris and Martin represent two of the five companies selected as part of the Cooling as a Service incubator. Chris comes from the Grupo Clima in Costa Rica and Martin from Grupo BGH in Argentina. They will talk about their interest in incorporating Cooling as a Service in their businesses 
and about their experience with the incubator, each within their particular circumstances. We will finalize then with the presentation of Alfredo Nicastro, who represents MGM Innova Group, who will talk about their experience with the sale of cooling as a service. Okay. So, Thomas, I would like to, he's going to start talking, speaking about like cooling as a service. Thomas, as I mentioned to you, is, la, is my colleague at base. He's an engineer with substantial in experience in Latin America, in Africa, and Asia. He's been leading the Cooling as a Service initiative as a whole and has really, I would, I would say, very proudly taken the initiative to, to a very good position where we are right now working with different countries across the world. He will give you more information about that. So I leave you now with Thomas. Please, Thomas, go ahead. Thank you, Carla. Hello, everyone. Um, so as Carla introduced, I am I'm Thomas, um, and I've been leading the Cooling as a Service initiative for, for two years now. And before I, I start talking about the model, I'd like to um, give a short introduction about the Basel Agency for Sustainable Energy, which is an organization where Carla and I work for. So BASE, or the Basel Agency for Sustainable Energy, is an NGO based in Basel, Switzerland. And we are a, a not-for-profit foundation and specialist partner of United Nations Environment. We were founded in 2001, and we have been developing, uh, designing, developing, and implementing financial mechanisms and, and strategies to unlock investments in sustainable energy, including renewable energy and energy efficiency, and more generally, climate change solutions. And since about a couple of years, we started focusing heavily on cooling uh, through collaborations with the Kigali Cooling Efficiency Program. And actually, uh, there was a report published by the IEA uh, now almost two years ago, um, which shows that investments in cooling will be considerable in the upcoming 30 years, about 6.9 trillion, which is about 230 billion per year. And the, the aim is really to have a big portion of these investments channeled towards green cooling or clean and efficient cooling. Why? Because cooling uh, has an important impact on the environment. There are two elements. First, the energy consumption and the refrigerants used by the cooling system. Currently, cooling systems or air conditioning actually alone, excluding even refrigeration, consume 10% of the global electricity. And this will triple uh, to reach 30% um, in, uh, in 2050. So the, this diagram explains a little bit um, the different or shows the the respective costs of operation and of investment. So you can see that a very small portion is actually the cost of the equipment itself and the remaining life cycle cost is mostly operating costs. So if you look at 12 years of this equipment, you can see that more than 90% of the costs are actually related to operation and maintenance, which means that if you save even a, only a small portion of this electricity, you quickly pay back your investment on a more efficient system. But still we are seeing that there are not many or the, the investment is not happening as fast as we would expect in more efficient systems. And we have a look now at why this is happening. Uh, we have identified through our work in the past years a couple of key barriers and the first one being of course the higher upfront cost of more efficient technologies so they're competing against cheaper technologies that uh, are also less efficient um, that's one secondly many enterprises um, have a lack in trust of the actual savings achieved so the performance of the system which might not in that case justify an investment in a more efficient system and finally, many enterprises prefer to invest in their core business and cooling is normally not part of the core business. So in these, in this context, uh, the cooling as a service model is actually uh, a very interesting model because all these, these barriers give space to a new, a totally new approach of, of cooling. Um, and what, what is cooling as a service really? It is what we call servitization. Uh, and servitization is a, a, a mega trend that is uh, not new in itself. Um, it has been existing for many years in different industries, and you probably know it best from the printing industry. Xerox has been implementing um, the paper use models for, for many years already, and uh, in which customers don't buy the printer, but basically paper copy. Uh, and uh, other industries have been doing it as well. For example, Rolls-Royce has been offering power by the hour instead of selling the engines to aircrafts. 
um, and the solar industry also had a big shift in the, in the last decade thanks to power purchase agreements which are which enable customers to purchase the kilowatt hours of solar produced instead of actually investing in the solar panel and now we're seeing it in new sectors in other sectors so for example cars there's some companies like Volvo which offer subscription programs to their customers in which they don't need to actually purchase the car anymore and even lighting so the airport of Amsterdam Schiphol signed a contract with Philips in which they pay lighting by the hour, so they, they actually didn't purchase the fixtures or the lighting, but they just receive the lighting, uh, the service of lighting and pay, pay for that service. And right now we are uh, basically working to bring this to the next step with cooling. It has been implemented already in cooling, uh, but we are aiming to accelerate this and to, to make this uh, more accessible to different stakeholders in the market, because we expect um, the cooling as a service, which is the same principle, to also be um, to take up uh, quite rapidly across markets. So the cooling as a service model was um, endorsed by the Global Innovation Lab for Climate Finance last year, which is a, a large group of investors and, and, and governments, uh, so from the private and, and, and public sector, which chose among more than 250 ideas, uh, five leading ideas to um, which can really have a big potential to drive climate change, uh, climate action, and uh, and cooling as a source was selected last year. So this is kind, of, it's kind of it's it's a big reward, a big award. And uh, the way the model works, it is a pay-per-use model in which customers pay per unit of cooling that they actually consume. The providers own the equipment and they operate and maintain the equipment. So for the customer, what has been before a capital expenditure becomes now an operating expenditure, which includes the full service. The fact that the, the price for the unit of cooling is fixed means, and it includes the electricity costs, means that the provider has now an incentive to reduce the consumption of electricity of that system because then he's basically um, reducing the cost to deliver, deliver that service. So there's a strong incentive for the provider now to optimize this equipment, so to install the most efficient system and also to offer excellent maintenance to make sure the efficiency stays that high. And the model includes some capitalization mechanisms, which we will talk about later. Uh, I just want to quickly mention the difference between uh, cooling as a service and other models. ESCO models is a model that many people know about, and it's uh, it's uh, uh, normally energy performance contracts in which the payments are tied to the savings. In cooling as a service, there's no link between payment and savings. The payment is only linked to the consumption of the cooling. And district cooling is similar to cooling as a service, but it's um, uh, one central plant that offers cooling to many buildings. And in this case, we're talking about one plant for one building. The key actors involved are clients, so clients uh, as in buildings, uh, enterprises, uh, so cooling users is, is a more appropriate name, technology providers or solution providers, and banks or investors. For cooling users, um, there is, uh, of course, the clear advantage that there's no more capital expenditure and there's a significant re uh, reduction in operating expenses because they're now operating a, a cooling equipment that is actually consuming much less energy which means that the overall cost for that service is lower than what they used to pay. The service is off balance sheet um, and the performance risk is totally shifted to the provider and in addition there's really a full outsourcing of the service which means that the customer can just simply focus on their core business. For technology providers, it is also very interesting because they can really deploy the full potential of the technology uh, because they are the one operating, they are the one that really manage the system and they're the one that know the system best. So it's really, they are best placed to manage or to operate the system in the best manner. And also providers can have predictable and continuous revenue streams, um, which was not necessarily the case before uh, where there were no long-term contracts involved. Um, and of course, it increases also the demand for more energy efficient solutions. Banks and investors are also interested in this vehicle because it's an opportunity for them to place green funding. Many banks and investors have funding available for green projects, but the, but the projects are not always bankable. Um, and this really means uh, now that it, it's, a, it's a way to, to make these projects much more accessible for financiers. And this also is why we are very much involved in discussions with financiers. Um, very quickly on the funding structure, there are two two ways here that we present. One is the sale and lease back. 
So this means, fund extractor means how do, what happens once you want to scale up. So in this one, you can see that the provider is basically signing a contract, a cooling as a service contract with customers, and is then selling that equipment to a bank and leasing it back from that bank, which is an injection of capital for that provider. And payment guarantees could reduce the default risk that the provider is exposed to. This one is a more classical one, a uh, special purpose vehicle. This is based on project finance. And this is basically an investor that sets up what we call a, a special purpose vehicle, which purchases the equipment. And that vehicle will be the one sending the contract with the client. And this vehicle then also signs a contract with the provider who offers this service. And I can go into more detail maybe at another stage. Uh, unfortunately, we do not that, have that much time to explain this in detail. Um, but we will share this and, and I'm available for questions. This is about the cooling as a service initiative. So we at Bayes, uh, in a collaboration with KSEP, have been supporting the markets to adopt this model. And there are a couple of components that were included in this initiative. The first one has been developing tools that enable the model, such as cooling as a service contracts and pricing models and financial structures. Secondly, we have been working with different technology providers and investors across the world to implement and pilot the model, uh, currently in, in different countries that I will show actually later on a map. We have, we have started a partnership uh, with different uh, of stakeholders that are involved in, in with Cooling as a Service to create what we call the Cooling as a Service Alliance, and we have now more than 40 members. And we have been doing uh, organizing several awareness raising campaigns, such as matchmaking events, workshops, different webinars, writing articles, and we're working on some podcasts as well to really make the, they make the broader audience aware of this model and the opportunity for all stakeholders. There's a website here, CAS Initiative, which you can uh, look at, which has uh, most of the information and the events, including this webinar and further webinars. This is quickly an overview um, of one of the tools or one of the results of one of the tools. I mentioned economic models, and this um, shows here that cooling as a service can be really the, the cheapest option for the, the end user. So the idea is not to have that the end users should be saving money, right? This is not just about saving the environment. Of course, this is fundamental and we want to reach uh, net zero buildings, but it's also about saving money. And cooling as a service, because it uses very efficient equipments, actually ends up being a cheaper solution for the user. Um, and for the implementation, I mentioned before that we are working with providers and investment funds to work in different countries to pilot the model. And we have, so we're working in Mexico, in Dominican Republic, in uh, Jamaica, Grenada, um, in Argentina, Nigeria, South Africa, India, and uh, MGM Innova, which is also in, in this uh, webinar, is uh, has been implementing cooling as a service in Colombia. And Martin and Chris, who are uh, also speakers in this webinar, are the respective representatives of uh, PGH, who is uh, implementing cooling as a service in Argentina, and Grupo Clima, who is implementing the model in uh, Costa Rica, which I might not have mentioned just before. Um, okay, so the Alliance, you are free to join the Alliance and to register to our newsletter. We, we try to, to provide interesting information and updates about our work. It's very easy. Um, we will also send you a thank you email in which you can click uh, on that link or you can send us an email directly. And you can also join the Alliance, which means you will also be exposed on the website. And the idea there is to share lessons learned, um, to spread the word about the model and to show that there's really uh, an agreement between stakeholders about what cooling as a service is and how we can implement it. So this is it for me. Um, I tried to keep it short, but I'm available for questions later. And I'll now uh, give the word back to Carla, who will introduce the following speaker. And my email is there and we'll also give it in the email. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, I would like to remind all participants about the possibility to make questions via the chat room in the control panel. Uh, let us know to whom you're asking the question, please, and this will be answered at the end of all the presentations. I would like now to welcome Chris Elizondo. Chris, if you could connect your video. Chris Elizondo is the general manager of Clima Ideal, one of the companies of Grupo Clima, a holding leader in the HVAC sector in Central America and the Caribbean. Grupo Clima is a Costa Rican business group with over 50 years of experience in air conditioning, refrigeration, building, automation systems, and ele electromechanical installations. In these years, as one of the largest contractors in the region, Grupo Clima has participated in some of the most important projects of the Costa Rican economy. About 15 years ago, it started working on buildings that optimize 
controllability and comfort for the users. Nowadays, its service also focuses on energy savings as providers of the latest technology and integrating building automa automation, sorry, <laughs> involving HVAC, plumbing, electrical, and other systems. So welcome, Chris, a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Carla. And it's a pleasure to join um, all of you uh, in this webinar. And first, I hope everyone, you and your families are safe and healthy in this middle, in the middle of this COVID-19 crisis. Um, okay. Uh, first, I, I would like to tell you a little about who we are. Grupo Clima is a Costa Rican business group with over 50 years of experience in air conditioning, refrigeration, building automation systems and electromechanical installations. Sorry. We participate in all the segments of the industry, um, industrial, hospitality, office centers, hospitals, clean rooms, data centers, supermarkets, residential and banking and commerce. Well, with 50 years of history, uh, as one of the largest contractors in the region, Grupo Clima has participated in some of the most important projects in the country. And here we have some examples. Uh, we participate in all the international airports in the country. Uh, we also are in the biggest hotels. And um, in here we have, uh, in the 2014, we were in the Hospital of La Nexion, Hospital of Trauma. And right now we're working in the new um, Turrialbas Hospital. Also, Grupo Clima is the contractor that leads the Central American market, according to the ACR Latin Americans report of the top 100 installation contractors in Latin America. And well, um, Grupo Clima is a holding of four companies. The biggest one is Clima Ideal, that is air conditioning systems, and we are dealers of carrier for more than 45 years. We also have Transclima, that is a leader in refrigeration systems, works with refrigeration solutions for the cold chain industry, and also is dealer of carrier transico for more than 28 years. Isa Controles, that is energy efficiency solutions for buildings and facilities, remote monitoring solutions, BMS, building security, voice and data systems, and so masking. And CMA, that is construction services for all electromechanical and mechanical systems, fire suppression, electrical systems, and industrial assembles. Our business portfolio and the range of products we have allow us to offer the perfect solution for each project requirement. And something that makes us proud is our service department. Considered the largest in the region and probably one of the largest in, sorry, the largest in the country and probably is one of the largest in the region. We have more than 400 maintenance contracts in the, in the country. We have more than 100 technicians within the company. And of course, we have the service 24 seven all the year. So starting to talk about the main topic of this webinar. A part of a corporate strategy, a a couple of years ago, um, the group was looking for innovative solutions for our clients, such as district cooling and cooling as a service. We believe in the correct management of the environment by designing energy efficiency solutions for our clients with the use of friendly refrigerants. And how Thomas mentioned, um, this year, Grupo Clima has been selected by BASE as one of the five companies that will be supported through their managed cash incubator. This includes assistance on technical, legal, and financial aspects, including contractual arrangements, pricing strategy, financial structuring, risk, risk mitigations, mechanisms, and other. Um, and we have been asked 
to share our experience so far with the implementation of the CAS model. So our experience in this process with BASE has been very professional, with a dedicated work team, with great commitment for the key aspects of the process, to ensure each opportunity turns into a successful and innovative project. At this time, we are reviewing legal contracts and um, making webinars with bays and clients looking for the potential candidates in our pipeline. So during the last months in our experience, the main benefits that customers have seen from these models are the no initial investment, the value creation, and the energy efficiency. With so much uncertainty, the client can invest in the core business instead of spending on cooling. More value is generated by efficient equipment, monitoring, operation, and maintenance, all in the same offer. And this model focuses on generating efficiencies and energy savings with 100% benefit for the customer. And what are the challenges from the contractor's point of view? for the implementation of CAS. First, the design and engineering. CAS is based on an efficient design and an analysis of the best solution for the customer. Second, the technology and equipment. CAS seeks to install the latest technology available on the market. The installation and the commissioning. The contractor must be qualified to do the proper installation as well as the requirement commissionings of the project. Automation and monitoring. Cooling as a service requires monitoring service to track performance and energy consumption of the systems. Operation and maintenance. Also in here, the model requires a qualified contractor to operate and properly maintain the equipment through all its useful life. And finally, but not less important, the warranty and the support. It is key to have the correct support in the country that can respond quickly to the situation that arises daily. So our conclusion is that it's very important to have a one-stop shop for technology, installation, efficiency, and support. And we believe that Grupo Climate Carrier offered the best alternative as cooling as a service in Costa Rica. And to finish, a final thought. Our experience with customers has taught us that it's not only about offering the latest technology from a manufacturer. It is having the right support in the country and a consolidated service department, what makes the difference. So thank you very much. This is uh, my presentation for today. I can answer questions at the end. Thank you, Chris. It was a really good presentation. And as you said, we are gonna leave questions for the end. So again, I encourage people to please make your questions in the chat room. Now, I would like to welcome Martin Mendez. Martin is product manager of the smart division of BGH in Argentina. He is responsible for the development of businesses focused on integrated solutions encompassing energy efficiency and smart buildings for the private and public sectors. Grupo BGH BGH boasts 106 years of innovation, development, and commercialization of cutting edge technologies, products, and services. It provides answers to the needs of businesses, public organizations, and customers across Latin America and Africa. The company has four business units, one of them being the BGH EcoSmart that develops energy efficiency and smart business solutions. So welcome, Martin. Please go ahead. Hey, thank you very much, Carla. First of all, thank you very much uh, to BASE for choosing us and thank you very much for uh, to World Green Building Council for giving us this space to communicate. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about uh, Grupo BGH. 
Grupo PGH, as Carlos said, is the longest standing technology leader commercializing technological vanguard products and services in Argentina. And we give answer to company needs, public sector, and also final customers, both from Latin America and from, Af from Africa. The history is very long. I'm not going to read each one of those milestones. But as I told you, we are a 106 year company. And our strength is that we always have the, 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 the strongest partners. Okay, you can check there below, like Mitsubishi Electric, Lennox for air conditioning, but also Motorola, Bell South, Huawei, Samsung, and several leader brands in the industry. Group of BGH has several divisions. These are the main ones with BGH Consumer, BGH Tech Partner, BGH EcoSmart, and Positivo BGH. I will tell you very shortly what each one of these does. BGH, uh, sorry, the operations. We have operations in Argentina, Chile, Peru, Uruguay, then another division, Tech Partner, also in those countries and in Brazil. Then Positivo BGH, it's a joint venture between a Brazilian company and BGH. We have operations in Kenya, Rwanda, Argentina, Uruguay, and Brazil. And BGH EcoSmart, so far we have in Argentina. We are manufacturers. We handle our own brand and we also make OEM. We have a 42,000 square meters uh, facility in Rio Grande, the south of our country, in Tierra del Fuego, that opened in 2009 with a total investment of over $80 million. We also have a distribution center in Buenos Aires, uh, 50 kilometers away from the capital. It's a 25,000 meter square where we handle all the logistics of our company and our customers. BGH consumer are all the home appliances. We are leaders in this segment in the country with our own brand, BGH brand, and we also handle other brands like Alaska, Nikon, Hisense, a worldwide known, Telefunken, and Beko. We focus mainly in home appliances from the air conditioning segment, TV, residential heating, kitchen, and white goods. Then we have a division, BGA Tech Partner. This division is mainly focused on government solutions and company solutions related to IoT, communications, connectivity, infrastructure, data center, consulting, and cloud solutions. And last but not least, EcoSmart. This is the division where I work at. EcoSmart was created, let's say, like two or three years ago. At first, it was only a division focused on HVAC. But due to the following aspect, that I would like to show you to highlight, we noticed that building operations and construction is responsible for 39% of all carbon emissions worldwide. We also saw that in Argentina, companies are responsible for 40% of the energy consumption at country level. And then we realized and we learned that the cleanest and cheapest energy is the one we don't use. It is cheaper saving energy than producing it. And by two, uh, there was an Argentinian law that states that by December 31st of 2025, companies must achieve a contribution from renewable energy sources to reach 20% of the national electrical energy consumption. Therefore, companies will need to implement practices for energy saving <clears throat> becoming a need. We also notice that we focus on offices, right? And we wanted to know which are the, the most important consumption 
of energy in, in these buildings. And we learned that 47% of the energy consumption in a building is from the HVAC and 26% from the lighting. Okay, so those two together are almost 70% of the, of the segments that generate the consumption of energy in an office. So we decided we should focus there. That is why BGH EcoSmart is a group business dedicated to develop energy efficiency solutions for companies, governments, and other organizations, where we integrate HVAC, lighting products, and services. We have more than 55 years of experience uh, developing HVAC solutions. Our division has more than 30 professionals with architects, engineers, and technicians technicians and we have we have more than 400 customers at country level and what we do is add value with innovation customer oriented and excellent nowadays we're focused in hvac where we handle a complete por portfolio with a, a company a local company with the biggest portfolio to offer in argentina where we handle the commercial light commercial and residential portfolio and we are partners ex exclusive distributors of Mitsubishi electric brand and Lennox brand that are high tier brand with very high efficiency standards we also developed the lighting business focused on commercial industrial and urban solutions with our partners shredder also shredder is a high tier uh, partner with products with very, very high efficiency and innovative solutions. And then we focus in energy efficiency in our customers, where we can do consulting and add value and give them business solutions. And then we notice we had to integrate all of this, right? If we're responsible of more than 70% of the consumption from a building, we need to be able to integrate. That's why we are developing the BMS um, portfolio, right? In order to guarantee a smart building management to control, to detect failure, to understand a real-time consumption, to be able to make a predictive and corrective maintenance, and to know our inventory and ambiental variables. What we do nowadays, when we have a building, we can make the consulting, right? We can also make the project design. We can provide with all the system and equipment nowadays with HVAC and lighting. We can be in charge of the assembly and installation of the units. We can make the startup and then the after sales service, but always very important we focus very much in training we train our personnel involved in all project stages installation commissioning operation and use and then the maintenance we can also offer a solution of maintenance once we already sold the project and installed it this is a very brief our portfolio in hvac with the different segments what's important here is that we can provide solution for mostly all the industries, hotel, office, hospital, shops, large areas, entertainment, residential. Okay, for those who don't know much about Argentina, Argentina has a gross domestic product of approximately 470 billion, and Argentina is one of the largest economies in Latin America. Argentina is currently in a precarious economic balance. You know, the peso devalued significantly in 2019, and we're with an annual inflation that is over 50%, and our GDP has contracted 2.5 in 2018 and 2.5 more in the first half of 2019. So we're kind of in the middle of the crisis. And then we learned that. Um, the Development Bank of Latin America conducted a study to identify the subsectors and strategic measures that must be advanced in our country. 
given its economic reality. The study focused on private initiatives that may flourish in the commercial and industrial subsector. And they, they made a list of 12 factors where we should work, the country should work to improve and to help with this crisis. And the number 10 was changing the current air conditioning equipment by, by high efficiency one. Well, what I mentioned before about Argentina and now with this pandemia, right, with the COVID, we see that in every crisis there is also danger, but also an opportunity. And that is where we welcome very well cooling as a service solution. And we see it as an excellent and innovative alternative to encourage new and more efficient technologies. Why? Companies now are reducing their budgets, right? They are either not changing their AC or they are using the cheapest solutions and focusing on initial investment rather than operational costs. Also in Argentina, let me tell you, unfortunately, there is very little consciousness on energy efficient solutions. People are not very much aware about that. Companies want to reduce their problems. They don't want to be thinking on the maintenance solution, right? They want to have a solution. Actual COVID pandemia will stress worldwide companies. Therefore, investments on local branches, we believe, will be much tougher, right? Because the, the, the company will have problems in their own place. So it will be much harder to ask for investments in local branch here in Argentina. Also, we believe that CAS will increase a lot of trust on the offered solution, right? Because we are so sure that the solution we offer with these units, with this installation, with this maintenance, we're so sure that it's good that we take full responsibility. And then for us, it is very important because our reputation in the market is very important. And CAS gives us the, 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 the possibility of taking care of our own brand because we are the responsible for making it work. And another aspect is the commercial aspect. CAS will enable us to make long and close term relationships with our customers because if we compare to another model where we just sell the units, we sell them once and it's very hard to keep on, keep the contact with our customer. With CAS solution, we have a constant contact with our customer. Why we, we, we believe we can do it very well? Because all I told you previously, right? We have an excellent know-how. We have a leading brand in HVAC industry, both with BGH brand, with Mitsubishi Electric, and with Lennox and Shredder. We have the most complete product portfolio with our air conditioning and with our building management solution. And we have strategic partners, both nationwide, to make the, the, the assessment in the whole country, the installation and maintenance. And we also have worldwide partners in order to provide this turnkey solution. Um, according to our business, right, our actual customers, we believe we can focus at this moment mainly in hotels, retail stores, entertainment, and corporate buildings. Those are the main cases and industries where we will focus to offer the CAS solution. Okay, well, thank you very much. And if you have any question, remember you can put it in the panel and at the end we can answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. So now, I'd like to welcome our last speaker, Alfredo Nicastro. Alfredo has over 30 years of experience and he's currently a senior vice president of global operations of MGM Innova Consulting, an environmental and social officer for the MGM Sustainable Energy Fund Tool. 
MGN Innova Group provides integrated environmental, financial, and technical solutions that contribute to sustainable energy management and climate change mitigation and adaptation. MGM Sustainable Energy Fund is a private equity fund that focuses on equity and mezzanine financing for projects in the energy efficiency and renewable energy sectors in Latin America and the Caribbean. A pleasure to have you here, Alfredo. Please go ahead. Thank you, Carla. Appreciate the introduction and thanks uh, also the previous colleagues for setting up the stage uh, so uh, nicely. Uh, it's a pleasure to be talking to all of you, connecting from different parts of the region and the world, and uh, hopefully uh, the safety of your homes in social uh, distancing. Uh, technology today allows us to, to do this kind of stuff. No? Uh, even though it's uh, never imagined that I would say that uh, someday I would be socially distancing, uh, working from home. But anyway, it's a challenge and we are up to it. So let's face it all together. Um, well, thanks. Uh, uh, to the award uh, uh, Green Business Council and also to uh, Bayes and, and Cass, uh, Thomas for inviting us uh, for this uh, great opportunity uh, uh, to, to discuss with you about uh, this interesting model. Cooling as a, a service, we believe it's a great uh, tool uh, that enable us uh, as investors and uh, service providers, uh, technology providers in the region uh, and in the world to, to help customers lower their costs and improve their uh, uh, sustainability, or their the sustainability of their operations. Well, uh, very quickly about the MGM Innova Group. MGM Innova Group is a is a, is a group uh, basically formed by three companies that that focus in providing technical, financial, and environmental solutions uh, that support not only uh, 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 the sustainable use of energy but also contribute to the climate change mitigation adaptation. And uh, how this all uh, came about, MGM Innova Consulting, one of the companies in the group, it's a, a legacy company from MGM International that it started operations early in the year 2000, so a little over uh, 20, 20 years ago, uh, that used to develop emission reduction projects under the Kyoto Protocol and also uh, 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 CO2 emission reduction platforms. So the company focused uh, the first uh, few years, the first eight years of operations on that arena, uh, basically uh, uh, developing that kind of projects uh, all over the world and uh, were one of the three top uh, developers uh, during that time frame. Uh, towards the end of the uh, 2010 decade, uh, we anticipated that with the end of the Kyoto Protocol, we will need to set up another, look for another financial mechanism to keep developing uh, these climate uh, change mitigation projects, right? So MGM started discussing with other players in the market and naturally uh, most of those players were development uh, banks from, from different countries and financial players that were already in the market and decided to move forward and set up uh, uh, our own uh, fund. So very quickly, MGM Innova Consulting is the legacy company. We do uh, still a lot of our climate change uh, consulting work. MGM Innova Energy Services is uh, 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 our branch that has um, our technical resources that help us implement, operate, and monitor uh, all the projects implemented uh, uh, by the fund. And MGM Innova Capital is a general partner, is a fund manager that currently manages two funds, the MSF1, which is the fund uh, that we created originally, and MSF2 that is in full force right now. I'm gonna I'm gonna provide a little more details uh, as we move along. So MGM Innova Capital, as I said, is a, it's a is a general partner, a fund manager, it's a private equity and green infrastructure investment uh, firm that focuses on socially responsible uh, projects uh, in Latin America. It is very critical for us that we invest only in projects that have a climate a component that uh, reduce em emissions, do not uh, add emissions to to, uh, to to the planet, right? So we look for sustainable uh, projects on that perspective as well. Uh, uh, very quickly about the uh, the two funds that we have, as I said, MSF1, the, the original fund uh, was a smaller fund. It was a $65 million fund, more or less. We ended up investing with a little debt around $73.4 million. As you can see, most of the investors there are, are development banks, corporation agencies from different countries in the world, Japan, Germany, Spain, uh, 
US, uh, the European uh, Union, um, Colombia, and uh, uh, that that fund is fully deployed right now. So we have uh, our funds fully invested. We are now in the divestment period of that fund. It's a 10 year fund, five years that we use for investment and five years now for divestment. The MSF2 is the one that is fully operational right now in the investment period. Uh, we already have uh, uh, $120 million uh, raised and available to deploy. And we are uh, doing additional uh, capital uh, raise and uh, we expect to close around 150, maybe a little less or more uh, throughout uh, uh, the end of this uh, first half of the year. Investors, as you see, some of the, of the investors are the same from fund one. And uh, we have a few other ones that I'm just joined, like a, a Bio from Belgium, FMO, uh, uh, a Proparco, uh, and as, as new uh, investors in this fund. Okay, the focus of the fund is Latin American and Caribbean. Uh, we can do a little bit of investment in Asia, but it's very focused to a specific niche. And uh, we also focus on energy efficiency and energy services and renewable energy. Different sectors, we are not, uh, we don't have any restriction uh, sectors. We will look project, for projects into any of those sectors, um, industrial, commercial, municipal, and our renewable energy. Our main focus is on solar distributed generation for auto consumption, but we also do some small hydro and uh, some landfill gas to energy and biogas to energy projects. We also do cogeneration and waste heat recovery, uh, e either through natural gas or biomass uh, sources, okay? So uh, a little bit of our, uh, the way that we operate and the, the, the features of our investment. The way we see ourselves, we are not only an investor, we are also a, a, a solutions provider because we provide uh, Solutions from cradle to the graves, cradle, so, uh, cradle to the grave. Sorry. So from early stages, uh, preliminary studies and engineering, uh, basic engineering, up to uh, uh, implementation of the project's operation and maintenance, monitoring, uh, we do it all. Okay. Typically, we can do up to 100% of the investment. Uh, we don't have requirements for capital contribution from our clients, local counterparts. Uh, we don't have to put 100% of the of the investment. We can do co-investment as well. Uh, we are open. We are very flexible. Once again, we invest in every single component from preliminary studies uh, down to the uh, O&M uh, as well, uh, taking the full service approach, which allows our allow our clients to focus on their primary activities while we do handle the implementation of the project and the operations maintenance uh, as well. That, that is very interesting because it basically frees up capital uh, from our uh, clients, uh, uh, the, the partners. It, it allows them once again to focus on their operations. And a very important component is that as you, you do that, as we do the investment, uh, we do this as an off balance sheet transaction, right? Which allows us to preserve the client's balance sheet and do not affect the debt capacity. Uh, they don't have to, to, to get that because we provide 100% of the investment typically as an equity investment. Uh, it also allows them to transfer that, that asset that would, would be in their books as, as a, uh, an investment, as an asset. They transfer that as a, a, an OPEX cost, okay, as a, a cost, which has a, a benefit, also a tax benefit at the end of the day, as it reduces the profit and you can basically deduct from your uh, uh, income tax. So there's a benefit there as well. Uh, contract terms, we can go up to 10 years typically because it's a 10 year fund. We may be able to structure contracts for longer terms. That's typical in renewable energy projects, but typically is within 10 years, seven, eight, uh, six, very commonly for energy efficiency projects. Uh, another thing is that by, by doing the way we do it, by owing uh, the, the, the assets of the project, we typically don't require guarantees or, or collaterals. Of course, it all depends on the, on the financial health of the client, of the local counterpart, capacity to pay and all of that. But uh, basically we try to structure it in a way that uh, they don't have to offer guarantees or collaterals. At the end of the contract the, uh, term, we, the, the assets are transferred to the client. And we can also have an early exit uh, 
uh, clause if he required uh, by our client to 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 review together in a certain point of the project just the exit and, and, and the contract okay so that's typically how we structure our contracts i'm going to be focusing uh, primarily on our uh, services model cooling as a service but i wanted to point out that the primary three uh, uh, financial and contracting mechanisms that we see in the industry. The, the first one is shared savings, very typical for ESCOs. Uh, there's also uh, the high efficiency energy infrastructure. Basically, you put together an infrastructure and you lease that infrastructure, or you do a sale, long term sale and purchase agreement, or you do a equipment rental. And uh, we do that a, a, a lot. And, and what I want to focus today is basically the high efficiency energy services why i'm not why i'm not saying CAS only because that can be done not only for coal for cooling but it can also be done for heat in for example you can sell uh, uh, hot water you can sell steam or you can sell electricity so there's other energy services contracts that are not necessarily applied to to, to coal uh, okay so cooling uh, as a service is is the one that i'm going to be focusing today. So we can basically uh, do those three. Uh, the shared savings is not very easy, not very common for an investor like us. It's very hard to, to, to monitor and to, to build. Uh, has not been proven successful for us, uh, but uh, the leasing, sale and purchase and rental and costs uh, are, have been proven uh, very successful, okay? Um, the perspectives uh, of us as an investor uh, or an energy services provider, the the CAS model, the service model, is definitely a trend in Latin America. Uh, we we have been seeing that more and more every day, but it implies an important important cultural change, right? If people are not used to paying for for cold water or for air conditioning services, they're they're very used to paying for electricity on a monthly basis, but not for steam or uh, uh, hot water or uh, cold air uh, cold water. So it, it implies an important cultural change. It, it definitely uh, characterizes, configures a new niche of opportunity, right? Uh, there's a lot of interest today from the clients to, to pay for these services uh, on a monthly basis, to pay for the actual consumed uh, cold water or uh, uh, tons of refrigeration per month, in, instead of uh, paying for a full facility that they are not going to use necessarily in full. So. It's, it, it's a trend and it's an opportunity that we are exploring and trying to incorporate uh, more and more into our business. Also, the, the, the model, the services model CAS, if properly structured, can reduce the risk profile uh, of the investment. Okay, if you, if you structure that properly, combining a fixed payment for asset remuneration with a variable payment for the consumed tons of refrigeration or uh, hot water, and have a guaranteed floor to be sure that you recover your investment in a certain period of time that you, you can minimize the risks while providing benefits to your clients. Uh, a challenge is that is still no too many insurance or guarantee products available in the market, but we always have the possibility in a contract like this to interrupt service. So that strengthens the mechanism a little bit, but uh, the fact that we don't have insurances and guarantees uh, uh, fully readily available are a challenge. Uh, there's a lot of risks that you need to mitigate, mitigate contractually. They're possible to mitigate, but you need to do very, very strong contracts. For an example, low occupancy in a hotel or commercial uh, commercial building. If they are going to pay you for the consumed the electricity and they are not selling the hotel capacity, maybe they're not going to be paying you uh, enough. So uh, you need to have a, a, a floor that ensures the, that you can recover the investment. But those are, are challenges that you have to look uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. Seasonality, of course, affects it as a summer high occupation of hotels, winter low occupation in places, in beach places. So you need to see how you mitigate all of that. Uh, ownership of the assets, as I said, uh, works as a, a partial guarantee of the investment. That's a, a, a strong aspect. And uh, our expectation is that this model is going to be disseminated. And as it gets disseminated, uh, uh, the contracts are better structured and, of course, minimize risk for all the, the parties. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit now about a specific case study, a project that we developed in Colombia. It's a, a, an office building called a Q Office in Medellin. Basically, this is a high efficiency central air conditioning system. 
Uh, we have uh, two uh, magnetic chillers from Daikin, very uh, efficient, uh, two units of 290 uh, tons of, uh, of refrigeration each capacity. Uh, uh, so Daikin, for an example, is one of the technology providers that we team up uh, 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 to implement those projects. Of course, we have to team up as well with uh, companies like uh, Grupo Clima or uh, uh, BGH also to help us implement the project, install and, and provide maintenance. And MGM is basically a fund, an integration company. We do not necessarily has, have our own construction installation team, O&M team. So we, we do that through uh, alliances in, in, in the different localities. Uh, of course, this project included everything from design, uh, construction, installation, and also administration and OEM. This is a new building. It was being built when we installed our system, so it was a little longer term. It was a two-year process, uh, but it was very, very interesting. Basically, the way it works is that the administration of the building pays uh, for administration fee and asset and part of the asset compensation while the individual offices pay for their own consumed air conditioning services, for their consumed uh, uh, tons of refrigeration. So we're talking about 100 different offices. We build them every month and they pay for their share of consumption. Right? So it's, uh, it's an interesting project, very successful project. Uh, cooling tariff uh, includes all the associated costs, maintenance, guarantees, extended guarantees on the equipment, uh, O&M fees, uh, everything that is in there, insurance uh, and, and parts, everything that is in, is included. So uh, you can always include electricity, that's the preferred model, the water that you use also in your chillers, uh, all, all of the uh, supplies and all, also uh, everything that is needed for your operation. It's a single services contract with the building administration, and then they have their own uh, uh, association regulation that includes the AC service. So the offices know that they have to pay for that service. And uh, that's basically how it's handled. We don't have a, a separate contract. We don't have a hundred different contracts with the different offices. So it's uh, easy to easier to operate uh, in this way. Uh, very quickly, because I know we are getting close to, to, to the end of the time here. This is a typical investment structure for energy services contract. I'm going to use the Q office case to explain a little a bit better. So this is a, a cooling as a service project. The MGM Capital and MSCF, uh, they're based uh, in, 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 in US and Canada. So it's an offshore operation. This is all pre-construction. Uh, this, this entity, the MSCF, forms uh, locally, typically forms an SPV, which is basically a, a, a contract uh, mechanism so we can operate all the project. And we, what we do, we capitalize the SPV, we put equity on the SPV. In this specific project, the MSCF has a partnership with Aire Verde, which is a local company in Colombia, who also have a little stake on the project. Aire Verde was responsible for the uh, part of the design, also installation and, and construction. So they are a partner also for o &M. So MGM has 80% equity, I revered the 20. We capitalize that company and that company contracts with the client with through an energy services contract, a cooling as a service contract, and also with all the parties. So MGM Innova Group is the integrator. We integrate through MGM Energy Services in this case uh, for the design, construction, installation, monitoring, and OEM. So MGM Energy Services is gonna integrate, supervise subcontractors and deal with uh, 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 service and, and technology providers. So at the end of the day, once the project is, is up and running, uh, we are going to, of course, bill on a monthly basis and QOFs pay us uh, uh, to, for the services rendered. And once it's all uh, said and done, we, we distribute dividends to MSCF and Aire Verde to compensate for the investment. That's a typical investment structure. We can talk in details if you want uh, uh, on a separate call uh, I'll be glad to discuss with you guys. So, of course, many, many benefits. Uh, uh, initial ones we can think is uh, energy sa savings. In this case, the project saves about $5.3 million during the life of the project. Uh, it's a uh, high cooling efficiency. You basic, basically save a lot of uh, electricity. In this case, it's uh, almost uh, 2 million uh, kilowatt hour per year. Uh, uh, the efficiency of the equipment is from 0.6 to 0.7 kilowatt hour per uh, ton of refrigeration. 
We also produce uh, emission reductions, greenhouse gas emission reductions. It's equivalent about 8,000 tons CO2 equivalent during the life of the project. Uh, we help uh, create project jobs, uh, sustainable project. We need to think about the social component as well. So during the implementation, we're talking about 40 active uh, people involved in the project during the two year implementation period and seven uh, 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 personnel staff for the operation of the project for 20 years. Uh, it's very important as well because we're helping build this model in an industry that, is, that has a potential growth. We expect about 18% growth in air conditioning uh, consumption increase in the next 10 years in Colombia. Okay, of course, there's many, many other benefits, but those are the critical ones. This is just a table with a few other examples. We have Q Office there. Uh, uh, it's a cooling as a, uh, as a service project. We have done a few other projects, Colanta in Colombia as well, which is steam generation from biogas. So it's a sale of steam. Uh, Technoglass, which is a glass industry. We have a cogeneration three megawatt with uh, natural gas, and we sell electricity. And uh, Acerias uh, uh, Paz de Rio, also, it's uh, it's a steel uh, company, so it's also a cogeneration project for the sale of electricity. Okay, so uh, we are based in the region. As I said, we have five regional offices in Brazil, uh, Mexico, Costa Rica, Colombia, US, and also have project offices uh, all over the region where we, we have projects implemented. Uh, we are very interested in, in, in looking for uh, local partnerships and co-developing projects with uh, anyone who would be interested in cooperating with us. So thanks once again, uh, be safe, uh, and uh, I'll be available for calls uh, uh, for, for questions, I guess, now uh, with the, the other speakers. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Alfredo, and thanks to all our speakers. Uh, I would like to ask you to please turn on your videos to all speakers so we can like address some of the questions. Thanks for everyone who has sent questions and if you still have some questions please don't hesitate and just type them in the chat otherwise you can uh, we can always like if we don't manage to answer them now we can answer them via like emails when we send a thank you a thank you note okay so in this case I'd like to start with a question and say I'm going to address it to Thomas. Um, the difference between applying cash to public versus private buildings, uh, do we see the same issues there, same barriers or not? So in principle it's quite similar as in the, from the uh, the way the mechanics work, um, there's not a key difference but the main difference there will be the procurement processes. So we had discussions with different governments and also with uh, so both at the, federal, um, the government level but also at the regional level and very often the issue was that there are quite some stringent procurement measures which means that it's not always easy to consider a service model as one of uh, in the tender basically. Maybe Alfredo has more experience on this? Yeah, yeah, thanks Thomas. Well, I would say that I agree with you. Basically, it would be the same uh, uh, system. One of the challenges that we as investors and a service provider face uh, when dealing with uh, public entities, not only, of, of course, the contracting process, but also uh, in, in the region, sometimes we, we, we don't have very strong uh, contracting mechanisms that are uh, sale, uh, 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 fail proof, I would say, for example, for government transitions. For example, we We've seen cases where you have a, a longer term contract for a service and then you have a, a, a change in administration and sometimes that may affect your, your ability to, to charge and be paid for your service. So there's an additional risk component that you need to see how you mitigate contractually. Uh, we, we have uh, uh, contracts with uh, municipalities where we provide lighting services, for example, and there are some contractual mechanisms that ensure that we can get paid, but e even with those mechanisms in place, it's a little challenging. So I guess it's more of a, a, a legal a contracting challenge than, than the service model itself. It's fully applicable and it, it, with the right counterpart, I would say. Okay, great, thank you. I'd like to ask another question that it has to do, Alfredo, if you can address it in, at the beginning and then I'm gonna jump to Chris and Martin. Given your experience, how easy or difficult has been to, or do you see, is to apply like cooling as a service or 
another kind of equipment as a service, like across the different Latin American countries and the Caribbean? Well, uh, I would say that uh, this is no, uh, it's not more, it's not harder or easier than any other contracting mechanism. Uh, we, we face the same challenges that we face on a leasing contract. The additional component I would say is that it's a it's a it's a novelty. It's a uh, it's it's not typical uh, that kind of a contracts in the region. So it it sometimes it takes a little longer to mature. You have to explain a little better the model. Uh, of course, there it's a cultural change that is implied, so makes a, a little difficult uh, sometimes for people to understand. But uh, if you're talking with uh, a major industries or uh, a big uh, commercial buildings or with a supermarket chain, typically it's a little easier for them to understand and for you to to, to negotiate. But uh, once uh, your your uh, partner, because we we don't see the people uh, in, in in the other side of the contract as a client, we see them as a partner because you're going to be in the long term with them. Is once they understand how it works and the benefits, uh, it, it actually it's, it's a enabler, I would say. So it's just a matter of uh, the cultural change and the new contract model that you have to overcome, and uh, basically. Perfect, thank you. So in that case, uh, Chris and Martina, I'd like to, to extend the question to you. Currently, we are working with supporting your work in Costa Rica in the case of Chris and Argentina in the case of Martin, but your companies at the same time have presence in different countries in Latin America. So in which countries would the, the, your groups be like uh, see that they're going to be offering cash in the near future what would be those markets where you do you think you have the elements to be able to offer the service not now but in the near future if you could start maybe um thank you um in, in the case of Grupo clima we are in nicaragua and in costa rica only so uh right now we are focusing costa rica for all the um situation that we are living economical and political in nicaragua um so we are really focused in 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 extend this model in costa rica and i'm totally agree with alfredo what he said um we need to work in a change of culture for our customers but when they understand all the benefits they um, are really interested in this model i think the the, the biggest challenge a, for the implementation of Colin as a service is to have all the um, the qualified contractors for all the useful life of the of the project, right? Because they have a lot of questions about not only the initial investment or where is the brand that they're going to put in the initial um, uh, months or in, in the first step of the project, but the real question is who is going to be with me the 10 years across so um that is the the things that we have to work and um the the clients ask a lot of about um the services uh how it's going to work in the time what happened at the end so when they really understand uh, all that questions i think is is the real and and the better solutions uh, the better solution right now for all the consumers. Thank you, Chris. What about you, Martin? Any any sort of ideas of where do you see yeah. the like, BGH developing? In my case, we have operations in several countries, but actually for EcoSmart, we're now focused on Argentina and we have all our network in Argentina. And anyhow, I do think that Argentina is one of the most appropriate to implement because as I mentioned in my presentation, crisis is the same is also opportunity and Argentina will be is handling and now tougher will be handling a very tight and hard crisis so I believe as Chris and Alfredo said we will have to explain it very well but if we can make the customer understand the solution I think it's going to be very interesting I'm not sure if everyone will switch to this kind of solution. Certain customers will be, will, will be interested and they will be appreciate that we, uh, as a supplier, present a different model of making business, right? Not the standard one, but adjusting to the reality we're living, we are living nowadays. So I think it's going to be. Perfect, thank you. 
another Come question on. that we have here. If I Sorry, may, Alfredo, please, go ahead. Yes, if Alfredo. I may, I just want, just want to add something, something else. I think uh, 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 an important thing about this model is reflected in the situation that we are living now, the contingencies associated with the COVID. It has demonstrated how susceptible uh, we are and companies are uh, through their operations to fix us, fixed costs, okay, right? So it is very import important that you manage your fixed costs in a way that you can minimize the impacts uh, of the disruption in your, in your operations and how can you innovate in this in this contract models so you minimize the impact of uh, disruptions in your production in your cash flows uh, associated with your fixed costs right so i think uh, the cas model the energy services model is very important because it reduces it minimizes the impact and also frees up equity if you if someone has just made an investment in november last year and spent 10 million dollars in a new uh, a cold water facility, chiller plant, you know, that, that capital right now, that equity is very critical. They could be using that to sustain operations. So those are two things that I think we need to, to, to think in the region that uh, these kind of models free up capital, uh, uh, minimize impact in your debt capacity for when you need it, and also allows you to minimize the impact on of a fixed costs in your operations. Thanks, Alfred. I would even say that they also help to align the incentives so each stakeholder behaves the best that can behave on the topic that they have expertise. And in, in that regard, uh, Thomas, I would like to ask you, why do we think that it's so important in the cooling as a service model to include the price of electricity? That, that is, that it's paid by the provider as part of the whole package offer as a service. Thank you, Carla, and to those who, who ask this question. It's a very important question, and, and we're asked this uh, quite often. And the reason is the following. In cooling as a service, the, the fee that the customer pays depends only on the amount of cooling that the, that the customer or user is, is consuming. And this fee is fixed and agreed upon in advance when the contract is signed. So within this fee, the provider is supposed to offer the equipment, the financing, the maintenance, operating, now that includes also electricity and water. And, and why? Because if um, these costs are included, that means that if the efficiency of the equipment ends up dropping or is lower than expected, and these electricity costs and water costs are higher than expected, then the client is not affected. Only the provider is affected by this increase in operating costs because he's the one paying for it. So it really creates an incentive for the provider to make sure the most efficient equipment is installed and to ensure excellent maintenance to, to make sure it's basically operated at the highest efficiency during the whole lifetime. So it's uh, that's the real the, the reason behind this. Excellent. Uh, another question. I'm gonna I'm gonna like make a couple of additional questions. The other questions that we don't manage to to address now online, we will address like via the the email link that I mentioned before. And here would be one, it's like, uh, what would be the unit, the, the most uh, efficient unit or the most well-suited uh, unit of measurement for CAS? Uh, how would it be measured? And maybe in that case, I would like to ask uh, uh, Thomas, basically from like the concept like um, view and then Alfredo from his experience. Sure. So um, as we have been working with different technology providers in implementing this, we came up, we worked with different types of technologies. So the, the key technologies we've worked with are chiller systems or VRF systems, which are normally used for bigger buildings. In the case of chiller systems, um, the unit normally used is ton refrigeration. It's a unit that's mostly used for these chillers. And normally you, you measure this at what you call the, the delivery point, which is the point up to which the technology provider is responsible. And this, uh, you basically need to measure the flow and the temperature, and this gives you the amount of cooling or turnover duration, and then you can price the, the service based on that. In the case of VRF, it can depend. Uh, sometimes the turnover duration can also be used, or it will be the amount of uh, liquid uh, cooling refrigerant within the system. Um, Alfredo, which unit have you used in Q Office? Yeah, that, that's basically, well, in, in Q Office, it's basically a, a ton of refrigeration and delivery or consumed by the client. So, measure exactly as you said. 
at the point of delivery. So it's basically Colombian pesos per uh, tons of refrigeration utilized per month. Excellent. Uh, Alfredo, it's going to be the one before last question. Is like, how does CAS aligns with the commissioning process and energy efficiency certifications, like for example, LEED? Do you see them as competing or really working together? They work together. This this uh, Q office project is a, a LEED certified building. So basically, we are aggregating to this to 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 the to the system because we are implementing a project that uh, is is energy efficient, uh, will deliver environmental and social benefits. So it's actually complementary. It, it was uh, a very smooth process for the uh, Q office project. So uh, I see them as complementary. I don't I don't see any problems. We can collaborate with the uh, with the auditors that come to audit inspect the building and to facilitate inspection of that particular part of the lead uh, certification so i think they are complementary and this is strengthens the the facility for a potential certification okay and then i would like to make the last question now live before like chris and martin and it has to do basically with like the mandate that we have as base to like at the end work on the development of cooling as a service response to like the Kigali amendment to the Montreal protocol and is the phase out of like more dirty refrigerants. So I would like and, and this clearly is being phased out in different ways in different countries. So how do you see like cooling as a service helping you as businesses transitioning from those more dirty refrigerants to the more clean refrigerants? Okay. Um... I think cooling as a service really uh, work together with this initiative because um, one of the things that you have to use in this model is the last, the latest technology, and um, it based in in the latest equipment and the latest technology that are in the market. And with that, uh, we are working with friendly refrigerants, and we are motivated that the client change the old equipment that they have in the projects for new ones and probably they don't do it before because of the invest uh, because they they need to invest in their core business and they prefer to to stay with the old equipment in, in cooling so um, with cooling as a service they have a, a tool for for change easier the equipment and put the latest technology and with that we are contributed with the change and motivated the change in the country and in all the places that we put Colina service. Thanks Chris. Martin any compliments? In my case I think it's the best because the one who will be interested in putting the most uh, the latest technology will be us not the customer because I will be the one defending the cost of electricity, electricity consumption. So why will choose the technology instead of the customer? So I believe it's going to be much better. Thank you. So basically, uh, with all like these very interesting questions and answers, there were still some questions that we didn't manage to to answer live, but we will do that. I wanna like close the webinar, uh, not before thanking the presenters of course all the participants but in particular to the world green building council as part of the partnership between base and the america's regional network of the world green building council we have had the opportunity to produce this webinar and as a closing remark i would like you to i'd like to invite you to look at our website the cas caas initiative.org for any kind of additional information and also for reaching to us if needed and the most important message I would say now is that we really hope to see you in, in another future event that we organize. But now please stay safe and healthy. And that I think is the most important thing for everyone. And we really appreciate the fact that you took some time to like join us in this webinar. Good evening. Thank you Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you to all our speakers and all the participants that joined this World DPC and BASE webinar. Uh, we had a great group of attendees, so um, 
just so you know, we will be sharing the presentations and also the recording of the webinar. And we will, as Carla mentioned, send some further detailed information to all of you. So thank you again for joining and stay safe.